Good morning and welcome to uh, this week's uh, edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, we are a webinar. Uh, you can call us that. We won't be offended. Um, we embrace it here. Uh, um, or we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Uh, the show is uh, free and open to anyone to watch, as are our recordings. Uh, we do record the show every week, and then our archives are posted onto our website, so you can go and watch those there. We also include any pres um, PowerPoint slides, as we're seeing this morning, any uh, links that might be mentioned during the show. All of that is included in our show notes afterwards. Uh, we do the show live every Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, but you, as I said, you can just check out the recordings if you're unable to join us here on Wednesday mornings. And we do all sorts of things here, presentations, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions. Basically, if it is library related, we are welcome and want to have it on the show and share it with everyone. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, and we do bring in guest speakers as we have this morning. Um, on the line with us is uh, Jasmine Dean. Hi, Jez. Hello. She's um, west of us out in Idaho. Uh, she's been on the show before, um, and she'll probably be on again. We're working on another session potentially coming up later in the year. Um, but she's going to talk to us. She's the director there at their district library, Port Neuf District Library, which is in Chubbuck, Idaho. And they've done something which not many libraries have done, I know. Um, it's, it's becoming um, popular <laughs> or something to do. Um, and... Uh, Either some libraries have done it with their entire collection or sometimes just partial collection, but getting away from Dewey, and as Jez so eloquently is putting it, killing Dewey. <laughs> um, so um, I'm just going to hand over to you to take it away and um, tell us what you guys did there. All right, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Jasmine Dean. I'm the director at the Portneuf District Library in Chubbuck, Idaho. I've been here about four years. And we have been working very hard to redefine what public libraries mean to our community. So today I'm here to talk about how we killed Dewey. Um, first of all, I'm going to start off by explaining a little bit about who we are. And we are a small library in Chubbuck, Idaho. We are outside of Pocatello in southeastern Idaho. We qualify as a small and rural library. We have about 12,000 people in our patron database, and we have 22,000 people in our population area. Our population area does share with a city library. The city of Pocatello uh, has its own city library, so the majority of people in our population area are actually within their city boundaries. So we do have 12,000 users in our database. We have 13 employees. Most of them are part-time. At the time that we killed Dewey, we had 46,000 items, and 6,000 of those were non-books, like CDs, uh, movies, puppets, video games, board games, and things like that. The biggest thing that we came to to decide when I took over about four years ago is that we really needed to define who we were. We kind of didn't really have a theme. There was a general lack in strategic planning regarding our definition of self. And as I mentioned before, we do share the area with a city library. We also share the area with an academic library. Idaho State University is all of 15 minutes away from us, and they have a very large research library. Part, uh, the city of Pocatello has Marshall Public Library. They are a, a large traditional public library that offers traditional public library services. So here we were. We were littler. We kind of were just bumping along, but we didn't really have a focus and a goal, so we decided that we needed to reinvent who we were and what our place was in the community. And we decided that we wanted to be the fun library. We wanted to really break tradition. We wanted to do things differently. We wanted to explore different ways of providing meaningful interaction and space and activities for our community of users. So after thinking about that, we decided that we needed to really make some huge changes to mark ourselves as being completely different from everybody else in the area. I'm going to talk a little bit about our users. Uh, because we kind of had this amorphous place, um, most people who needed academic research went to ISU or needed traditional public library services would go to Pocatello. So our users were browsers. 
they don't use the catalog. They typically don't have computers at home. They don't really understand about searching very well. They are physical browsers. They like to maneuver through the collections and explore the library. Most of our users are primarily fiction users. They love their mysteries and their westerns and romances and things like that. And we are very much on this side of the digital divide. I don't know how many of you saw the Pew report that came out a couple of years ago that showed that the, lowest bro the slowest broadband in the entire country was in southeastern Idaho. And we definitely have some infrastructure problems. Because of that, um, as I mentioned before, the majority of our users don't have computers at home. We're seeing a large trend that is skipping desktops and laptops altogether and migrating to smartphones and tablets. So because of this digital divide issue, we didn't feel that it was fruitful to really invest a lot in offering a significant amount of online services. So we wanted to change things so that we could enable what our users were doing, and that was using the physical location in a very physical way. So our inspiration um, really came from visiting the Anythink libraries in Denver. And we went as a group. There was six directors from the Library Consortium of Eastern Idaho, which is 24 libraries here. We all went to Denver and we toured and visited, visited all of the Anythink libraries. Anythink is pretty famous for redefining themselves and implementing the BISEC subject headings. And BISEC is the classification scheme that is used by bookstores. Um, Maricopa County in Arizona was the very first library in the country to do that. Uh, Anything to, did the same thing and they really kind of put themselves on the map because they were very prolific with their marketing and publication of that change. So we went and visited and as we went through this process, I really looked at our, uh, our collections. We definitely had declining circulation. We had really overcrowded shelves. Everything was really chaotic. There really wasn't a whole lot of new and interesting things that had been coming in. And the really awesome, interesting books were pretty much hidden away in all of this tremendous amount of clutter. And because it was overcrowded and unused, we felt like we really needed to make some changes. So what did we do? Well, we studied the bisect headings and we decided that some of it just really didn't fit for Idaho. For example, Idaho is very active. We are all outdoors peoples. We love to be outside. We love to hunt. We love to hike. We love to camp. We love to fish. And again, getting back to the digital divide, there's not a great deal of internet activities that pull us into the home. So as a result of all of this outdoor stuff that we do with gardening and preserving and um, just being outside all the time, we needed to modify the bisex subject heading. So the best example of this is that we pulled anything that we classified as an outdoor activity outside of sports. So in bisex, Camping and hunting and tracking and hiking and fishing and archery and all those sorts of things are under sports. But in Idaho, if you ask the common person what sport do they like, they'll say basketball, baseball, things like that, and kind of gloss over the fact that camping is classified as a sport. So we pulled those things out and we made a subject heading and we titled it Outdoors. And all of the things that people do in Idaho outside was put into that. So that was a big change that we did. We did a few other minor modifications to make it more tailored to our community, but by and large we just stuck with BISEC. So we did make our own headings though um, cribbed from the BISEC classification. So one of the things that we discussed was that do we really made sense to us as librarians, library professionals, we understand where to go in the Dewey ranges in order to find materials, but that really doesn't make a lot of sense for our users. You know, 
we type, type, type into the computer when they ask something, and then we give them three or four different ranges. So for example, if somebody is coming in and they want to learn about keeping chickens or keeping bees, we might give them things in animals, we might give them things in insects, we might give them things in construction. But with our classification, what we did was pull all those things together. So all the chicken books, even about chicken feeding, chicken hatching, building chicken housing, they're all together under farm animals. Same thing with beekeeping. So we really kind of looked at that because we felt that giving people three different locations to go in the library with these nonsensical numbers just really didn't work very well for anybody. And that reading words on labels and having very clear delineations of where things were would be easier for people to think about. So here is an example of our categories that we did. And again, we primarily use BISEC, but there is a couple of changes. Um, one of the things that you'll notice here is that we have our categories. Then we have our subcategories. So under art, we have film, illusion, music. And you'll see there's a couple of musics. Well, that's because there's a general, there's a how-to, and then there's a sheet. So in some cases, we needed to create subcategories that we felt broke down those, um, those subjects. Another example down here is crafts and hobbies. Under crochet, you might want to specifically look for Afghan books or sweaters, or making granny squares. So we felt that we needed to break these down. Now you'll also notice that we have staff assigned in these columns. And that's because we went ahead and we gave each of these nonfiction areas to a staff member. So we have specific staff that are responsible for determining what goes into these collections, how often it's shelf read, how often it's weeded, and what we actually purchase. And in doing this, we really created subject specialists. So people were getting used to the collections. They understood what was in their collection, what they wanted to buy, and how it related to our users. And we also have an example in our spreadsheet of a spine label format. Now, I am happy to give copies of this to anybody who is interested. You can email me. It's in Google Docs, and I will just simply create you your own copy, and then you can edit it and do with it as you see fit. So that is something that I'm, I'm happy to do um, for all of us. But this is an example of our nonfiction categories with our subsequent subject specialists and uh, the spine label formats. And we'll get back to labels in just a minute. So like I was talking about, we definitely focused with nonfiction first. We ran some user surveys, and we would ask people, you know, we're thinking about uh, putting things in a genre order. How do you feel about this? And the majority of our users weren't exactly sure what nonfiction was. So since we had declining nonfiction use anyway, and most of our readers were fiction users, we decided that we could completely revolutionize how we were going to uh, project nonfiction. So that was our target, was doing nonfiction. Um, we focused on the adult nonfiction first, and then we focused on the juvenile nonfiction section. And what we did with the juvenile nonfiction section, which has been tremendously successful, was match it to the school projects. My children's librarian is a liaison to our school district curriculum committee. So she went and had conversations with the curriculum committee to determine what projects would be so that we knew when the kids were coming in for the state's projects, all the states were together. When they were coming in for the president projects, all the presidents were together, so on and so forth. And that's been really, really helpful because parents come in and they're frustrated and their kid needs to get six or seven different things for a report. Well, they come in and they say, my kid's doing a project on biographies. Well, we already know because we've been talking to the curriculum at our local school district, and we can send the parents and the kids straight over, get up without even looking at the computer and typing up call numbers or anything, 
get up and physically walk the users to the location in the collection and say, here are all of the biographies for your age group, for your project. And that's been wonderful. It's been just hugely successful with, this, with the kids and with the parents. Okay, so initially <laughs> we had a plan A, which was to kind of go section by section. So how were we going to do this? Um, what we were going to do, we had this beautiful plant and we had this neat little um, range of shelves that was right next to it. So we cleaned it all off and we decided that we were going to just slowly but surely pull everything together and we were going to start with gardening. So we were going to put all the gardening books next to this beautiful plant. We were going to pull them all out of the collection, relabel them, and then put them there. The next we were going to move on to automotive. We had already gotten rid of our reference collection, but we left the books on the shelves, and the majority of them were the automotive books, so we were just going to relabel them all, leave them there, and call that the automotive section. So we were going to pull one heading at a time, and we were going to move those things and just shift and shuffle collections as we often do in libraries anyway in order to make uh, this transition happen. However, we kind of had a change of plans. My board approved a major renovation project in my library and we emptied the building in order to re-carpet and repaint. And what that meant is that we really got to reinvent the wheel and start from scratch. So what we did is we just rented a couple of containers and completely emptied the library. We boxed things in rough order, so we already knew that we wanted to have our headings and we knew that we needed all the history books together. So as we went through and boxed the collections for storage, we tried to the best of our ability to box them together either because we knew they were in Dewey ranges and therefore were in rough order and then added anything else that we wanted to to fit into our collections. It was really, really chaotic, but in the end, it was really, really worth it. So what did we do to change? Well, we definitely did a lot of planning. The library was founded in 1958. It was full of tons of junks. I mean, we still had stuff that had been donated by academic libraries and public libraries from all over the place to fill our collections. We weeded heavily. We weeded almost 4,000 nonfiction books alone. We removed the squid cookbooks because we did not feel that was going to be of interest to our users. We pulled out all the tech books from the 80s. We had all these books on the Mosaic browser, which completely irrelevant for our users. We had some really awesome stuff that talked about the development of um, wireless telephones. I don't know if any of you remembered when you got a wireless telephone in the 80s and it had an antenna that was like 16 inches long. But we had all this really awesome stuff, but we pulled it all and got rid of it. Um, in that year, we also created our subject headings and subcategories, and we planned out how we were going to do our labels, and we also really planned our shelves and our locations. So we thought long and hard about each subject that we had and where we wanted it to be. So if you look here, you can see our map of our shelf ranges. We decided that we were going to have X number of shelves of gardening. X number shelves of crafts and hobbies, X number shelves of science, and we, dis we redefined our ranges here in order to accommodate for those shelves. Now what this means though is that we chose specific sizes for each collection and those sizes are permanent in their size. So you can't grow gardening beyond its shelves. You can't grow religion beyond its shelves. So what that means is if you buy 15 books, you're going to have to pull a subsequent amount of books to make sure that you've got space. And we did that on purpose because we didn't want to reinvent the problem we had with all of this tons of clutter. 
we needed to have these sections, we needed to have everything very organized and tight, and also make it a little bit more high turn, right? We've got the academic library right down the road, we have the very large public library down the road, so we needed to be a little bit more cutting edge and making sure that our things were constantly rotating in and out, and if something doesn't get used, it gets withdrawn. So as a result, if a hardback book doesn't circulate in five years, it's withdrawn. If a paperback doesn't circulate in two years, it's withdrawn. And then we replace it with other things that are more current, more relevant, so on and so forth. Now you'll notice around the edges here where we do have some genres for um, fiction. And I will get into that a little bit later. I just want to point it out while we're looking at this slide. And you'll also see the majority of this stuff down here is fiction. And those are still in alpha order. Our long-term plans are to genreize, as it were, uh, the fiction, but we haven't got there yet. But we are doing a pilot project with our paperbacks. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. So why did we do it? Well, like I said before, we really wanted to get away from the difficulty in trying to communicate to our users how 600 relates to animals. Instead, we wanted to create these categories in these discrete locations that enables our community to browse, to use the space for their personal information needs, to be able to explore and wander, and instead of having these long Dewey Decimal numbers, which are confusing, but ha instead of having discrete categories um, that better fits what is relevant to our users because we did invent our headings to match where our users are in what they like to do and what they like to read. So that was our major motivation for doing this. It did take quite a while. Uh, we were closed for two weeks in the renovations, and we actually were open for, we had a portion open so people could still use the children's room in the hallway when the main library was closed. And when the children's room and the hallway were being redone, the main library was open. So we did still provide some rudimentary service for our users, but essentially we were kind of down and out for about two weeks while we were doing all of the major carpeting and painting. Um, unboxing took a few days beyond that, and again, we did continue to provide service, and it took us about eight weeks to relabel, and I think that it would have taken us less time if we had dedicated staff, but again, we have 13 people, many of them are part-time, and only about three or four of us were actually doing the relabeling and reorganization work, and that was in, ad in addition to our regular duties. So. We had people who were doing programming, and then when they weren't doing programming and had an extra hour, they were relabeling collections. So it definitely took us a lot longer. I think that with the size of our collections, we could have been done much more quickly if we had dedicated staff or volunteers set aside. But we did not, because again, the massive renovation project with emptying the library and bringing everything back was really unexpected for us. And it was a benefit, but it did definitely changed the way that we had planned stuff. It was a little bit laborious. It was definitely chaos. A lot of our users were just confused about what was going on because there were people and carts and labels and stickers and sheets and boxes and all this kind of stuff everywhere as we were moving around. But at the same time, users are incredibly patient when you explain to them that we are trying to do something that's different and we want to make it better, and we're really excited to show you, and just give me 15 minutes to try and sort this out so I can find you what you need. Of course, since nonfiction was also very underused, um, we didn't have a ton of people that were actually asking for nonfiction books as we were reinventing the wheel. I think that it will be much more difficult for us to do this with fiction when we get to that point, because fiction is so highly used. But anyways, so it did take us quite a bit of time. Um, as a result, as we were working through this process, like I said, we deleted um, approximately 2,000, two and this slide is old, to about 4,000 nonfiction books when we were doing this. So that was a huge amount of nonfiction that we weeded. 
Uh, we also purchased just as many new nonfiction books. So this past year, the majority of our collections budget has been going to renovate nonfiction, which has been just tremendous. So at, pre at the time of this, uh, these slides were made, we had 98 non adult nonfiction books and 3,600 uh, juvenile nonfiction books and tons of new labels. And here in this next slide, now you can see an example of what our labels look like. So we have our major heading, in this case science, and then we have our subheading, which is in this case biology, and then we had author, and then we have title. So everything is still in author order, and then it's in title order alphabetically. So you can see here with these biology books that the authors are in um, alphabetical order. And then after, if we have multiple authors, or I'm sorry, multiple books by the same author, then the titles are in alphabetical order. So we still have that consistency with the alphabet. Uh, alphabet. Um, it's just that now we have those primary categories ahead. So what happened? Well, <laughs> this was hugely received by our users. People were just unbelievably happy with it. And it's so much easier for the staff as well. So when somebody comes in and they come to the desk and they say to us, I need a book on Parkinson's disease, instead of us breaking eye contact from our user and looking at our computer screens and doing a bunch of typing and scribbling down some nonsensical numbers, we can smile, continue to maintain eye contact, get up from the desk, and walk them to the physical location in health. So it has really helped with our customer service because we're not delaying people while we look things up or trying to explain how to look stuff up in the catalog because it's much easier for everybody to just get up and walk the user to the area that they need. It has definitely improved browsability. We often find people just wandering around looking at stuff looking at, at family, looking at do-it-yourself, looking at crafts and hobbies, looking at transportation at the train books. It just really has enabled people to use the library and explore. And that's really what we're about, right? Cultivating the exploration of stuff. And our users can come in, they can sit in couches and chairs, and they can just explore our stuff. And that's been really, really wonderful. Here's an example of what our stuff looks like. So this is, again, this is a picture of science. You can see that we have our primary category of science, and then we do have our subheadings. We got these neat little shelf markers that have triangular pop-outs for our subgenres. Like any classification scheme, we've got our general books first, and then we have our subcategories in alphabetical order after that. Now, another thing that we did is we, again, really looked hard at the space that we wanted to devote to each category. And we allow on every single shelf room for either a sign or a display. So we are marketing our stuff with nice display stands and space. It's very easy for users to come and pull things. It's very easy for staff to shelve things. And then we just pull pretty looking books that we put to try and cultivate use, to draw people into that subject, into that collection. And this has been widely received. And again, if staff order quantities of books for their area, they are expected to weed quantities of books so that we don't create clutter that we just spent all this time removing. So what happened? Well, as we were labeled, we did have to change the catalog records, and it was very, very easy. All we did was open the record on the items or on the bib, depending on where we were, what the focus was, and we just removed the call number, right? So instead of having 636.95, we just typed in what that call number was using words and spaces. It was very, very easy to do. And like I said, there was a handful of us doing it. We didn't have everyone doing it because we were still providing public service as we were making these transitions. But it was very easy to change the cataloging records and print new labels. 
in Polaris, we created shelf locations for each category, and I assume most ILSs would do this, but what that enabled us to do is pull statistics on each of these sections so we can see, you know, is history really worth the amount of space it has? Is it getting the use that we thought it would? And that's really nice so that we can see what we need to make grow and what we need to maybe change. So here's an example of what our cataloging records look, or our uh, OPAC records look like now. So you can see that this was how the West was worn, and our category for it, our classification and, and call number, as it were, is art, fashion, author, title. So instead of having a call number in Dewey, we've got our classification right here, plain language books, tells you the shelf location, which is the major category, and that relates to the physical map and the physical location of the collections, its status, and its item type. Another example, hauntings from the Snake River Plain, metaphysic, paranormal, hauntings. Shelf location in this case is new nonfiction because it's a brand new book to us. Again, status in material type. And again, another one, a history of cemeteries in Pocatello. History, U.S., Idaho, author, title. Again, another new nonfiction book, but this is, this is what we're getting at here is that our call numbers aren't Dewey, but they're actual real words that people can understand. Here's an example of a junior. J for junior fiction, states Idaho. Again, many of our subjects in junior nonfiction relate to the curriculum projects. So all the states books are together. You can see right here, junior, states Idaho. Another example, uh, junior, jobs, because they have a major project on jobs. Now we did not do author and title breakdowns because many of our users of that age area are browsers and we don't beat ourselves up about making sure that everything is organized. We just put all the jobs together. We do put in state order and in country order, but with certain things we just kind of just lump them all in and then they can look at all the bird books, they can look at all the insect books, all the dinosaur books, they're all together. And we're not beating ourselves up where we're trying to make everything very minute in those sections. And then a final example, here's another one for a junior record, Junior Presidents Bush, because again, this is a major um, project in the curriculum. Okay, so well, what happened? <laughs> we had a significant circulation increase, 250% increase in nonfiction circulation within the first year a 250% circulation of nonfiction books. That is tremendous in a community that is fiction readers. All of a sudden, nonfiction books are neat and fun and important and easy to find, and it floored all of us when we pulled this for comparison and determined how much increase we had. We've had a 90% increase in our circulation overall, and over a year out, we're about a year and a half out now from this change, we have still had just a tremendous circulation increase. So like I said earlier, we have 12,000 12, people in our patron database. We average about 10,000 circulations a month, and I think that's pretty good compared to how many people we've got with cards and how many books we're circulating. The other thing is that our biography section did increase because if it was about a person, even if it was an autobiography or what have you, we just stuffed it into the biography section because it was easier for everybody that way. Staff reactions, at first not everybody was on board, but after seeing all of this and seeing how it was working and seeing how easy it was to find stuff, everybody is now on board. And of course, our users just absolutely love it. And people are starting to ask us when we're going to be doing this with fiction because they want to have all of their genres together. All right, some pros. Better browsing for users by far. Um, it is super easy to shelf read because you don't have to try and train people to understand where these decimals work, relate them to the Dewey's cutters, watermarks, you don't even have to worry about any of that. It's just simply category, subcategory, author title. It's very easy to shelf read, and it's super easy to find things, too. 
because things are, it's pretty obvious where stuff is now. We have a physical location for all related items, um, and it's really helped us kind of define and hone our collection. So if somebody wants something and we don't have a section for it, well, we ask ourselves, do we really need to buy it? Is that maybe something we shouldn't interlibrary loan and see how it goes? Because if we don't have a category or a place for it, yeah, maybe it's not something that we need to buy for our users. So it's really helped us figure out what is meaningful to um, our community. Some cons, um, there is additional work for ordering, right? Everybody has to know where that thing is going when they get it. And in our book order workflow, there is a place now for where that item is going to go. So if I buy a crochet book, I'm going to put in that sheet that it is a granny square book, or it is a sock book for knitting, or it is a history book in Idaho. Because we need to identify where this is going so that when the item gets here and our team starts to process and catalog, they know exactly what to put on the label and where to route that item. And the subject specialist has already chosen and selected. So there is a little, that extra step. It's not just a matter of downloading the Dewey number from OCLC or what have you. You actually have to know in advance when you buy the book where you want it to go in the collection. There's a little bit of extra work for cataloging. Again, they've got to look at the spreadsheet. They've got to see where people have decided that item needs to go. And then donations become, <laughs> it's kind of interesting because we've got the one person who does donations, but at the same time, everybody pours through them. And then they're claiming, oh my gosh, I want this on hiking and outdoors. Oh my gosh, I need to have this in places because we needed a book on touring Italy. So on and so forth, we've got people who are much more interested in figuring out as a team where the books are going to go. So, and sometimes we've got staff members that fight over stuff. You know, do, do they want that in places or do they want that in history because it might go in both. Um, we do have some duplication, not very often, but if we get two books on hiking trails, we might put one in outdoors and hiking and we might put another in places, Idaho. So we do have a little bit of duplication, but we don't intentionally buy duplicates for two locations. It's only special exceptions it's if it's an Idaho author or if it's related to the state that we'll get duplicates and put them in both places because we actively collect for uh, Idaho books and Idaho authors. And if they are like hiking or what have you, we might have them in places as well as outdoors. But generally, we just choose one place for things to go. Okay, so some of our next steps, um, we've done that pilot project like I showed you earlier with our paperbacks. We've been training our users that all the romance paperbacks are here, all the western paperbacks are here, all the mystery paperbacks are here, and that was kind of training wheels for doing this with fiction. Um, with the fiction, we do need to choose what genres are relevant to our community, and we're still working on that because it may be that we have a, we're, we're definitely going to have a, general fiction area, and we might end up putting um, horror books in there, which is less interesting to our community, and then having a Christian fiction section, because that is of greater interest to our community. So we're still working on focus groups and staff time to figure out what are going to be the most popular genres that we need to really develop for our fiction uh, collections. Now, we've decided that all authors will be in one place. So if you've got an author that writes across multiple genres, we're going to choose the genre they most write in, and all the books by that author are going to be in that one place. So when you've got people coming in saying, where are the Danielle Steele books, we can point them to romance. And maybe there's some difference, but by and large, all of her books are in that all the books she's writing are going to be together so that when you've got the people who come in and they ask for their favorite author, you can still get up and walk them to one location. Okay, so well, what do you need? Well, you definitely need to weed. I mean, gut your collections. Really cull the dead fall so that you're only focusing on what is relevant to your community, relevant to your planning, relevant to what you want to present, and relevant to what your users are going to use. Just get rid 
of anything you've got questions about because you can always get another copy, buy another book, get another section, and you know, be flexible because you might have a whole section that's meaningful to you that has absolutely no use whatsoever to your users. A year and a half later, we are still making some changes. We just fractured social, or I'm sorry, um, social science, and we now have folklore and mythology and self-help, and we got rid of a ton of other stuff because it just wasn't circulating. So be flexible. Really look at what you're, what you're doing, but weed heavily. Create your categories that are relevant to your community. I think it's really important to identify what is going to be of value because there's some stuff that are going to be of value to us that may not be of value to somebody else. So really look at what kind of community you have, what programs are successful, what people are volunteering for, what initiatives and overarching plans are being done by your curriculum committees, by your, your community groups, and really tailor your collections to that. I think that's really important because it's only going to add value to your community and your place. And really lay out a good plan. Make sure that you've got all your variables considered. You know, make sure you know exactly how you're going to go about making this change because it is a tremendous amount of work. I think you will reap benefits if this is going to work for you in your library, but you've really got to think long and hard about all the different pieces of the plan. What's going to get moved first? Where's this going to go? How are you going to fill these? When are you going to relabel? What are you going to do about the catalog? Lots of different pieces with making this kind of a move. So give yourself time to really plan. It took us a year of planning before we actually did this. So give yourself lots and lots of time to really dot the I's and cross the T's before you move, uh, move forward. So what do you need? Well, you're definitely going to need storage space. Even if you do it section by section, you're going to have to have some sort of staging. So if that means that you have a bay of, of uh, ranges in your back office area where you can shelve several shelves of books while you're making changes, you're going to have to come up with storage space. <clears throat> like I said, we ended up renting two giant semi-containers because we had to empty the entire library, furniture, books, the whole nine yards, everything had to go. But if you're going section by section, you're still going to need that storage space. You will need so many labels. And this is what got us label covers. We didn't even consider the fact that we were going to need reams and reams and reams of label covers. And golly, those things are really expensive. And that was just completely unexpected for us. We didn't even consider how the cost of relabeling all these books. You're going to need lots of boxes, so start working with community partners and grocery stores, maybe get U-Haul to donate. We had our local U-Haul donated tons of boxes to us. Uh, we had the local liquor store was saving all of their boxes for us. We also had an automotive store saving boxes for us. So start getting your community partners involved because you can, you can ask people for donations, and people are often very willing to, to do these sorts of things um, if you give them enough go ahead. And again, this gets back to storage space. You're going to have to store the boxes. You're going to have to put this stuff somewhere. And of course, come up with a, clan, a plan for keeping stuff organized. How are you going to keep track of these box books or the shelf books? How are you going to keep track of all the things as they're moving through the workflow? So really think about that again and, and, and draw maps, make pictures, do outlines, whatever is going to be meaningful to your organization. So how are you going to get some buy-in? Well, take field trips to libraries that have done this. Um, propose a pilot project. Perhaps take an underused nonfiction area and just say, you know what, this is going to be our pilot. We're going to use this. Maybe pull out all the true crime books. Maybe pull out all the biography books. We already have these sorts of things in different places, so just make a pilot and see how it goes and see how users react, see how staff react. And then share the stories that you hear. So talk to your board or your governing bodies about the different ways that you've heard of libraries. There are success stories out there. There are three libraries in the state of Idaho that have killed Dewey and have success stories. Maricopa County, there's lots of people that will talk to you there. It's a wonderful, friendly library system. Anything in Denver, also very, very receptive. They would be just delighted to meet and talk with you or, or chat with you over the phone. So share 
the success stories that you hear to get buy-in. We are more than happy to talk, and uh, we've had a lot of people come and visit us, and we will spend time with libraries who want to learn more about how we successfully killed Dewey. So use the people who have already done this and have positive and negatives to share so that you can get buy-in and figure out what you want to do. And what do you do when you hear that we've always done it that way? Well, yeah, but you know what? <laughs> Change is inevitable except from the vending machine, right? So that means you've got to try new stuff. Got to figure out how to be relevant. Got to figure out how to keep up with the times. So try something new. What's the worst that could happen? You put it all back? Well, yeah, okay, so that's a ton of work, but so be it. You have to try. You have to keep trying, you have to keep initiating, you have to keep thinking new, thinking outside the box, and doing good assessment and determining, you know, is this something that we want to do? Now, a lot of people have also brought up the fact that they're teaching Deweys in schools. Well, I don't know about your state, but I know that in my state, most of the elementary and middle schools don't even have a librarian anymore. They have volunteers. So there's no Dewey being taught anywhere, and if these kids do go to college, they're going to be in a Library of Congress academic library, and they're going to have to learn LC anyway. So why not try something that may work for your users? We do not want to torture people and have them have this huge wall of difficulty when they come into the library. We want to be happy and put on a smiling face and create an environment that is comfortable and enjoyable. And this is one way of trying to do that, is so that people walk in and they see big signs with their area so they can just browse and explore and play and create and have fun. These are all these things that we're trying to do. And for us, getting rid of Dewey and providing these sorts of common language words for classification was really a big trick for us. So there's some things to think about with that. Um, but again, you know, figure out what is going to be good for you and good for your library. Okay, so we still have eight minutes, and please ask questions. Hello. Sorry. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> great. Thank you, Jess. Um, yes, we do have a bunch of questions that have come <laughs> in, of course, and that's great. Um, as Jasmine said, officially we go we go an hour. Um, we started a little after 10 today, but we'll go as long as we need you to answer all the questions. We do not get cut off here um, on our time as far as the um, session is concerned. Um, so we'll just um, go through the questions and um, try to answer all of them that we can. Um, a lot of basic questions. Anyway, this is great. Um, I, I know this has been an issue that a lot of libraries have done it, some have tried it, some are very wary about trying it, don't know like why should we, things seem to be working fine, or why can't we just do something different with the Dewey that we have, I mean there's all different things. Um, you're mentioning um, finding libraries near you that do it, we've actually had some here in Nebraska, for you Nebraska people on the line who I know that did it. I know Seward Memorial Library is one of ours that tried it, that did it a few years ago, I don't remember how it's gone since and it's been a while, um, but just recently I, I also had some, um, a library, our La Vista Public Library, um, the teen advisory board in their teen area switched, so all the teens were par participated and organized with it, and I didn't, we had um, the librarian from there, their young adult librarian, um, Lindsay Tomsu on the show talking about um, doing that in their teen section. So um, tr testing it out in a small part of the library before going full on of the whole, you know, the whole thing. Um, oh, and someone else just said, oh, Louise Alcorn, who's in I uh, Iowa, said North Liberty, Iowa Library also did it. Um, so if you're in Iowa, there's another um, option. Uh, Jenny Garner there is a director and loves to talk about it. So yes, definitely, I'd say do a Google search on libraries, getting rid of doing your libraries and doing, you probably find a lot <laughs> that are out there. Um, okay, let's just start with our questions that we have here then. Um, okay, I'm just going to start at the top here. We've got, um, for are the nonfiction and biographies shelved by reading level in the in the juvenile nonfiction area? Have you done anything with the reading levels there? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> okay. We have AR levels in the children's room. So we have three discrete areas in our library. We have a children's library, we have a teen room, and then we have an adult area. And we did that 
not only to split out the books for approximate reading level and project, but also in order to create zones for noise. So we have mm -hmm. three doors and rooms for each of those areas. And you know, as you can imagine, the children's room is absolute chaos and pandemonium and piano and play and laughing and playing and <laughs> right. turtles and magnets. And then we have the teen zone with gaming and Legos and maker spaces and all this stuff. And then we have the very quiet general section. So we do have mm -hmm. AR leveled books in the children's room. And our children's librarian works very, very hard to make sure that those things are identified in order to accommodate that. In the teen room, where the majority of our juvenile nonfiction is, we do not because most of those are for curriculum purposes. So they come mm -hmm. in for a research project. We do have some nonfiction in the children's room that are at AR level because we do have those requests where you know, the kids need to read X number of nonfiction books mm -hmm. at their reading level. So we do that. And as we have time, we also put the AR level of all of our books. We just write it in in pencil on the front cover. Mm -hmm. But we actually go to the point of labeling and stickering those in the children's room. Mm -hmm. um, because by, they get to the, by the time they get to the teen room, um, most of that stuff is curriculum-based, and we don't bother trying to put the AR reading levels on those. Right, it's a different reason. And that actually answers someone else's question from farther down that I saw here that wanted to know if your juvenile books are blended with the adults or separate, and you just said you've got totally separate rooms for each yeah. teen, children's, and then all the other ones. Um, okay, um, how do you differentiate between fiction and literature? This is from way at the beginning when you were talking about... We don't. <laughs> we absolutely don't because mm -hmm. our users don't determine between fiction and literature. Right. So, you mm -hmm. know, we've got classics, classical literature items in our um, fiction areas. We do have a literature section in nonfiction, and that is typically stuff on writing styles. Our grammar guides are in there. Um, short composition type stories that are not necessarily... Um, fiction are in there and that is another category that we're really looking heavily at because it is underused altogether mm -hmm. it's just people are just not going there it's not of interest to our users so we're trying to figure out where in fiction that stuff needs to go so you know some of this classical stuff goes into its genres and mm -hmm. we do have a general fiction section that we will be creating for stuff that really doesn't have a genre or authors that don't have a specific genre that they're a primary author in and we'll be putting stuff there as well but it we don't have a user base to really justify that right. sort of section and that is a section that is currently on the chopping block in our nonfiction because it's just not being used. Mm -hmm. I think this is something I may have missed when you're talking earlier I was you know keeping up with questions and things um, Paying attention to what your users are reading, not just assuming, and how they're looking at things and what they're looking for. Did you actually get input from the community, like ask them to come and talk to you about it as well and share with how they thought they would want to find things? Or are you just doing this based on you talk to them anyways and they come in and just kind of anecdotally everyone collected what they'd always been, how they'd been working with your users? Well, we, in Polaris, we were able to create shelf locations for each category. Mm -hmm. So I can pull stats. I can go to my superstar, Josh, and say, Josh, mm -hmm. I need the circulation statistics for social science. Mm -hmm. And he can pull those for me so I can see. And then I can compare. Well, okay, so we have, you know, 36 shelves of social science, and we've got 21 shelves of outdoors. But social science is getting no use, and outdoors is through the roof. We need to make some changes. Right. So Polaris yeah. statistics us can to tell you that. a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know our users. A lot of times, if we stop and ask them, you know, can we get some input from you? Uh, they don't. They don't always know enough about what it is that that social science is. I mean, what is social right. science? Yeah. We are social scientists. <laughs> we know what social science is. But if I go down the street to the Jackson's convenience store and ask the guy who's buying a lottery ticket and say, what is social science, he's going to give me a look and be like, what? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we needed to redefine that, obviously. And now that we are able to pull those statistics, we can hone in on 
what is meaningful and what is not meaningful. And this is still changing. I mean, we're still figuring out. It's only a year and a half out. And mm -hmm. like I said, literature is not being used. It's time for us to figure out where to put that stuff that it will be used. Right. Yeah. Um, so here's another question from the group. Uh, how much time did the changeover take, changing the catalog and relabeling everything? It took us about eight weeks for our collection, and again, I think it would have taken a lot less time if we had dedicated staff, but mm -hmm. there was like three or four of us that were doing it, and we were doing it in addition to all of the rest of our duties. Right. And you also so said that you had the whole intensive. I thing about having the whole library redone as well. So was that at the same yeah. time? <laughs> I mean, there you had like too many. I was like, really? Yeah. Uh, well, you want to, okay. <laughs> seemed like yeah, a lot going yeah. on. I mean, yeah. it was just, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it was really job. incredible. And, and as the only salaried person on the payroll, I was pretty much working seven days a week for about two months. Mm -hmm. And I could come in on Sundays when the library was closed mm -hmm. and all of the mm -hmm. stuff, because what we would do is when we unboxed after the renovation, we put stuff in rough order. So it was total mm -hmm. chaos. And we just knew that this was the science section. Well, when we had time, we would pull a cart we would relabel it, we would change the catalog stuff, and then we would put it back on the shelves. And then mm -hmm. after that entire section was done, then we reorganized. So there was chaos, and it was, I mean, it was pandemonium for about eight weeks, mm -hmm. and it worked for us, you know, because we still had kind of a rough idea, but we would have to go fishing in the collection on the, I think we had like three or four questions during that time. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the users were really patient. They're like, you know, I'm, I, this is awesome. We tried to pick a time of the year when academically it was not such a big deal. So we did this yeah, change yeah. between um, Thanksgiving and January. So, you know, there's not a ton of stuff going on around that time. So, you know, most people are really prepared for the holidays. Um, we didn't do the, we did the junior stuff last so that if there was kids that needed stuff for projects. And of course, we also have two other libraries in the area. So we can also say, well, I can't find that because we're in chaos right now, but you know what, Marshall's got a copy. Let me get it. Let me send right. it over to Marshall. Yeah. You got back up, yeah. yeah. Um, so you said it's been about a year and a half, and someone wanted to know the 250% increase in circulation, yeah. that's from, from in how long a time? From when, when that did was that? A, that was a year. That was okay. after the first year. So mm -hmm. when I first did this presentation for ILA, it was about 11, 10, 11 months after we had done this. Mm -hmm. um, we have since then lost all of our statistics because we did a migration oh. and we lost all of our use. So when we migrated to Polaris, which was right before this, and so the numbers we were not able to compare. So at this point in time, we can say that first year was 250% because we tracked it. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I can just simply tell you the overall percentage of circulation increase. Mm -hmm. But it definitely that made a difference. Yeah, that's... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's, it's tremendous. Okay. It's really tremendous. And I love it because I'm not a fiction reader. I'm a nonfiction reader. Ah, and I just mm -hmm. love to see all of these beautiful little bookies <laughs> that are gone nonfiction that are yeah. going and being mm -hmm. read and loved, and that makes me very happy. Yeah. So uh, another question. If you have corresponding media like DVDs or audiobooks, do you shelve them separately or near the appropriate nonfiction section? So we shelve format them wise. separately. Okay. We shelve them separately by format. Anything does have everything together. So mm -hmm. if they have a baseball DVD and a baseball magazine and a baseball audiobook and a baseball book, they're all in baseball. So if somebody we wants baseball title, anything, they yeah. just go to the baseball shelf and it's all there. They go yeah. to the, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. We did not do that because we have groups of users that come in specifically for large print, specifically for audiobooks, specifically for movies. And we did not feel that it was going to be in our users' best interest to mix media. So mm -hmm. we still have discrete locations for those items because we have large amounts of groups that only come in just for those items. Right. Now, for the DVDs, I'm actually asked this question since you're talking about that now, sort of. Um, did, how would it work for them? It seems like, she says, says, it seems like a big label for a small package, <laughs> you know, to put the yeah. actual label on it. Yeah, and our DVDs are different. Our DVDs are um, not genre at all because our DVDs are very high turn. As soon as a DVD yeah. doesn't check out for a year, it's gone. 
Mm, so okay. we we are very aggressive with buying the new stuff. And as a matter of fact, last month Josh reported to me that fifty percent of our adult circulation was movies. Wow. So you know, we're all laughing that we've become Blockbuster since Blockbuster's gone. Yeah. You know? And, uh -huh. hey, that's fine. You know what? Yeah, I would absolutely. rather my users use that than pay for Redbox because that's just mm -hmm. a waste of money when well, we've got all the yes. hottest stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we did not genreize the nonfiction in our CDs and CDs and, and movies. Those are still, they're broken out by nonfiction fiction and children's and mm -hmm. they're in DVD binders and you shop through the binders and you pull the sheet out for the corresponding movie take it to the service desk and they pull that item from behind the counter so but we did not even try mm -hmm. now we can yeah. do keyword searches in Polaris so if somebody says mm -hmm. I want a documentary on Egypt then you we can, can track go ahead down. and yeah. we can see if we've got one and then mm -hmm. we can tell them exactly you know and and, and work out something that way but mm -hmm. most of our people are again are browsers they prefer to browse we have a whole little area with tables and chairs and and seating and benches for people to shop through the movies and the CDs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that part. I remember that was one of my favorite parts of going to my public library was um, just going and browsing the shelves and not even going to the either the card catalog when yes yeah. I used when I was younger <laughs> and yeah. or the online catalog. Oh, so I have a specific thing I'm looking for. Yes, if I need I need a book on blah or I need this specific title. Yeah, of course you look in the catalog and say do we have do we have that? But if I'm just I'm just wondering about the you know Irish folklore and where's yeah. that shelf and let me go look and browse. That was to yeah, exactly. And that I'm talking about in college, yeah. Uh, okay, so here's one um, One of our directors here in Nebraska. She, he's been jumping in and out of the show during the time, so you, I know you've mentioned this, so I just want you to briefly for him say, um, is there a generic listing of categories that you break down into? And this is the um, the BISAC that you guys based it yeah. on, correct? Yeah. If you want the full BISAC, Anything has on their website the listing of the BISEC categories. Mm -hmm. If you want a copy of our version, you can email me. I will create you a copy, share it with you on Google Docs, and then it's yours to do with as you see fit. You can download it into Excel. You can do whatever you want with it. Okay, because um, we did have then, someone else who said they wanted a copies yeah. of the documents emailed to them, but do you have a slide here that had your email address on that you can yes, put up let or me something? Advance, yeah, because we're, we're, there you go. There you go. So, yep. So if you want by some, all means, yeah. Email me. I will share that with you. It is a Google Doc. I will create you your very own copy, and then you can edit it. You can do whatever you want to it. You can make it yours. I think that, especially for the smaller libraries, um, think really hard about these BISEC classifications because some of them just aren't going to fit for your mm -hmm. community. Yeah, you got to you got to customize it. Yeah. Absolutely, and so we really actually, we had a lot of fun figuring out what was going to be relevant and what wasn't going to be relevant, and like I said, we're still learning. I mean, we're still making changes. We just killed social sciences and broke it out into discrete areas that were more meaningful for our users because yeah. it was very obvious to us that um, social science as a section was not working, but folklore, mythology, and self-help is working. People understand so, that, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, be flexible and keep your eye on things and, and be prepared because we are constantly changing and evolving. But mm -hmm. yeah, anybody who wants a copy, I will share you a copy happily. Cool. Yeah, and just so people know, I did include already in our delicious links that we always put in the end of the show, um, I've got a link to um, your library's page and the Anything Libraries page. And I even did a search for a BISAC and found the main page for that system, um, the subject setting system for that. So um, if you want to go directly to the original thing or what anything has or what um, Jasmine's using. Um, okay, short, easy question. What is your collection budget? I can't remember if you mentioned that or not. <laughs> I didn't. Our okay. collection budget is about $60,000 a year, and that's for just for physical and non-book items. Databases in a, is in a separate line. I think we have about 11000 we spend on databases a year, not very much. Um, but that's what our collections buzz budget is, and we do have it split out so that there's a certain amount for children's, a certain amount for teen, and then mm -hmm. a certain amount for non-book item. Because as I indicated earlier, you know, we've become the blockbuster replacement, so mm -hmm. we really yeah. need to make sure that we're staying aggressive yeah. uh, with Even, our non-book purchases. Yeah, with all those things that are not 
not, or that our non-books, um, Maurice yep. Coleman, our friend here is online, he said that's what pays the bills, whatever they're yeah, coming it, in and looking for, absolutely. Exactly. The, the so, movie. and that's yeah. what, I, yeah, that's what I've been telling my staff. I'm like, if we spend all these times dealing with these binders and these movies and the blah blah blah, well, you know, like that's what our is valuable to our community, and that's what we need to emphasize. Now, mm -hmm. we also do check out board games and we check out video games as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we we have a lot of non-book items. Yeah, that's becoming even. It's been in libraries for years and years, and it's getting even yeah. more. Yeah. Um, now, here's something I'm not sure if you know the answer to, but you might because you you I know you research this. Um, if you know how prevalent is this model, the bookstore quote unquote model in academic or special libraries or is it mainly just public libraries that are doing this? To my have you heard of any academics? I had not I have not, but no, I haven't hmm. either. I um, the libraries that I've talked to have all been um, public you know, this might be of interest to special libraries, maybe perhaps a special collections or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't historical I don't societies know. or museums. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or genealogy libraries, things like that. I don't know if this would work very well for academic libraries. It's a whole different vibe. It's yeah. a whole different reason for using the library. Yeah, it's yeah, I don't know. yeah. And think of the cultural shift you would have with that. So you've got a professor who is tenured, who is brilliant, who is a geometrist, who knows that his section is four you know is is QA 408 he knows that's where he goes for his geometry and you're going to have such a huge cultural shift if you try and do this sorts of things now that doesn't mean you can't try and it doesn't mean that you couldn't like perhaps maybe your study guides which is a smaller collection in academic libraries you know you could do that by genre and start exploring how this may or may not work. But I think that for academic libraries, the cultural shift mm -hmm. of moving away from Library of Congress is going to be huge. Right, and that's different. Library of Congress versus Dewey, that's a whole other issue not not to be really getting into here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I have opinions um, on that because I've worked in, in all of them, and I've been in yes. academic library for eight yes. years. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that LC is a much cleaner classification system than Dewey, ah, personally. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, here's another question, just curious, do you con did you consider putting um, the Dewey numbers alongside the new um, topics that you were doing so it would translate to use at other libraries? Basically your, um, I think she's talking about the, what you had, your charts of what your terms that you're using, um, did you consider having that in there so that people could make the match, oh our Dewey numbers is this, so this is what we would use for the um, subject heading instead? No, we didn't. We wanted our real estate on our labels to reflect our collections. And we, you know, and, and again, this is part of us deciding that we're going to do things differently. We wanted to redefine how libraries uh, are meaningful to their communities. And so when we have other users come in um, and then go back to their home libraries, you know, they, they are faced with that learning curve of trying to figure out where other stuff is. Um, mm -hmm. We're happy to help explain and look up because we mm -hmm. are a shared consortium mm -hmm. so we share our ILS with 24 other libraries so I can look up and say that okay so this self-help book is going to be in this Dewey number right this chicken construction book mm -hmm. is going to be in this Dewey number if you go and get it from Marshall or if you go to another library but right. and those libraries we, have not done what you guys have done so no they have not yeah. and there's only one other library in our consortium that's killed Dewey and that's the Bear Lake Library in Montpelier mm -hmm. and she did it you know Mary Nate did it before us so mm -hmm. she came back from anything and she did it right away and mm -hmm. ah. for, for, <laughs> yeah she was she was on the ball and you know and, and us we, we we took more time to really mm -hmm. plan and weed and and um, whereas Mary Nate just was like, nah, -uh, and she just went in there and she conquered it and took it over and she did it right away. So there's there's one other in our consortium mm -hmm. that we have, but the majority <clears throat> of our libraries have not. Cool. Um, a specific question: Where do you put your drama and or poetry books? Where did they fall in? Right now, um, poetry is in literature. Poetry is not of significant interest to our community, so we mm -hmm. typically don't buy poetry books. We have some in literature in the teen room because we do have projects that are curriculum-based, but for our adults, we really don't get a whole lot of that stuff. And mm -hmm. at the drama stuff, we, we try and look again at, at what other corresponding genre it might be in in order to put those things 
where they will get browsed. People are just not looking at literature here, so we're trying to figure out where it's going to be meaningful to put it in the library, and then we mm -hmm. put those things there. Right. And our, our last typed in question here, I do have some other things coming up. Um, Okay, uh, someone says they wanted to put their children's section in the BISAC order, but they didn't think it would work for the adults, which I know that's what you have done. Any recommendations, and their specific question is, any recommendations on keeping only part of the library in that order and part of it's in Dewey still? Sure, you, like you can do whatever okay. is going to work best for your community, I say. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have not yet done all of this stuff in our children's room yet. Because we are creating. Because you guys categories. are not, you're in, you have not done your entire library this to this. No, this to we the still, whole library yet, right? Yeah, we still have the children's room to do, and what we're going to do is we're not going to split out fiction and nonfiction in the children's room. It's going to be the princess books, the curious George books, the fairy books, the truck mm. books, the Star Wars books. That's what the kids come in and ask for. That's yeah. what they're asking for, and yeah. we're you know we just can't. And our children's librarian is amazing. I mean, I go in there and I have an OCD fall apart because I can't handle it. You know, <laughs> there's like J, E, B, and then there's like three shelves of them. And I'm just like, you know, I, my head explodes. I can't deal with that. Um, but she knows, Amanda knows where everything is. And, and that's her skill set. That's her area. But when we do get to that point, we're doing it by request for the children. Because the little kids come in and they want fairy books and pony books and truck mm -hmm. books and skateboard books and Star Wars books and Curious George. And mm -hmm. Might as well just have them all together. Yeah, yep. Okay, one so question. I think just... that, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, that's okay. I think that whatever's going to fit for your library best, and if you think that your adults are not going to adjust, Go mm -hmm. ahead and try with the kids and see how it works. And, you know, it, it's, it, it will either succeed and the adults will be like, oh, my gosh, you have to do this for our stuff, too. <laughs> or it'll stay the same. Or, you know, I mean, like I said, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to have to put it all back. Well, mm -hmm. that would really suck, but it could be done. Yeah. And uh, Maurice Coleman says, so you're using customer language to organize your children's collection. That will help yes. them discover things. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Their own that is what, language. That is, yeah. Yes, we are trying very hard as a culture in this library to make it more obvious to them that this is theirs, and all we do is take care of it. This is not my library. It's not our library. It's their library, and I sit here, and I take care of it for my community. So whatever they want, that's what they get. Yeah, that's an awesome attitude to have, of course. Uh, and one other question came in. How would you classify your juvenile nonfiction books if you have more than the school district? Books. Um, yes. What we've done is we've done it by request. So we've mm -hmm. got all the school district books for the curriculum, presidents, states, countries, animals, what have you. And then we have truck books and BMX books and motorbike books and military vehicle books and that kind of stuff. So then we went to, um, you know, that like Maurice said, the customer language and mm -hmm. what the kids are looking for and asking for. So we broke it down that way. We did not, we tried to match it a little bit to the adults, but we split quite a bit because mm. we've got these overarching areas of interest where kids are coming in and they want skateboard books. So just make a skateboard section and call it good. Yeah. And one other comment he has is describing it, we facilitate discovery. That's a very nice yeah. <laughs> phrasing. Okay, that's all for the typed in questions that we had. If anyone does have anything else, feel free to type them in. Um, we do have someone from here in the Library Commission who wanted to be unmuted to ask you specific questions. So I'm um, going to do that. Um, I've unmuted you guys. Are you there still? I yeah. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay. Hey, Jess, it's Michael. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm going to represent the skeptics here for just a moment. Yeah. Um, I, I love pretty much everything you've done. Uh, you remodeled the library. You rearranged the collection to respond to the customers. You've increased your signage. Um, all of those things are wonderful and I think really did help, you know, improve your circulation, weeding especially. Um, but, you know, that final step of you replaced numbers with words. Uh -huh. Couldn't all of that have been done and still kept the numbers? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. You can certainly do that. And what we wanted to do was pull the different 
parts of the pieces and put them together and have greater control over where we wanted those things to be than just a classification of a Dewey number. So again, to, to get back to an example of that, we wanted all the chicken books together. So chicken housing, chicken pens, chicken feeding, chicken hatching, everything's in, in chicken. Now you can do the same with Dewey. You don't, I mean, you don't have to go to the trouble of relabeling everything. You can come up with the same sort of concept with Dewey. The problem right. that we had with Dewey is that it didn't make sense to our users. It was too difficult to give people three or four different locations for the same topic that they wanted. There wasn't an, an ability to browse because it was too nonsensical, too jargony for our community of users and so we decided that for us the natural language was was a change you don't have to I mean you certainly don't have to again I think that it really comes down to what's going to work best for your strategic plan for how you want to interface with your community and most importantly what your community really wants well I I, I guess the the the, the I, I do see where you're coming from but the the Dewey number that comes in the book is not necessarily required for you to use. You can still use yes. Dewey numbers and put all the chicken books together. You certainly can, but then you need to actually have a person on your payroll who can use the Dewey schedule. So in some of these libraries, if you can't download the Dewey number, you've got to try and figure out how to use whichever edition you've got of the Dewey schedule to classify that somewhere else. And and, so it's, and, it's and also you, easier for the staff because we don't have a formal MLS trained cataloger on okay. staff. Okay, fair, fair enough. That's, okay. that's another part of it too. I mean, you, you can. You can certainly say that, yes, this is a construction book and it should be in the 300s, but I'm going to put it in the 600s. You could certainly do that. For us, that would have been harder because then we would have had additional training and so on and so forth. Um, and the other big issue, too, is that we wanted to break up the long ranges of Dewey. So we had, oh, to 900, and it just was this long, continuous thing, whereas now we have very discrete areas of sections, and that's it. That's science. It's those shelves, and that's it, and this is health, and it's those shelves, and that's it, and there's physical breaks between each of those collections. And that has also really helped, I think, for discovery and browsing. Okay, and I, you could do that with Dewey too. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Sure. Well, no, and I and I, I mean, I with, uh, I'm I'm still reserving judgment on the whole thing, but I, <laughs> I I think those those specific points you just raised, I think, kind of fills in the gaps that I was yeah. missing as to why you actually did it. Thank you. Sure. Cool. All right. Okay. A um, couple of questions did come in while you guys were chatting. Um, Question about where to put a biography, and I guess this would depend what you said on your situation. Would it make sense to put a biography on a baseball player with the baseball books or the biography books? We decided or, that if it is yeah. about a person, it goes in biography. So our biography section grew, it, and, and we are just jammed right now at max capacity for biography. But at the same mm. time, Biographies are, are a huge interest to our communities. Our, our people love to come in mm -hmm. and browse the biographies. And they're all biography, and then they're in alpha order by the person it's about. So even if it's an autobiography, it's still by that person. So it's not mm -hmm. alpha by author, it's alpha by person. Hmm, okay. And so that people, if they want a Lincoln book, they need to go to the L for Lincoln as opposed mm -hmm. to, the, to the author. Um, so we chose that if it was about a person, then we put it there. And yes, this did this does mean overall that we need to take more time when we look at things and determine, do I want this in biography? And I have a whole subject specialist for biography. My administrative assistant, Susan, governs those things. And we'll go back and forth and we'll say, you know, this is about this famous Wild West woman. Should we put it in biography, or is it about enough of Montana that it needs to be in history? Mm -hmm. So we do have, we do take more time, and I think that this is a luxury that we have in smaller libraries, where we can really pay attention to these little guys and, and make sure that we're putting them where we, we think that they would fit best for our community. We have that luxury here. Mm. Um, yeah, and this person was pointing, it wouldn't make more sense in the baseball section. But also, if someone did come up to you and say, I want to read about a baseball player, you can always yeah. search the catalog for biography, baseball, and then figure out 
you know, if you don't know exactly. a bunch of baseball players at the top of your head and that you happen to have a book on them, that's then what the catalog can be used for. Yeah, and most of our people who come in, and and this includes the kids that come in because they need to do a project, a a biography on a person, they already know that they want to do a project on Babe Ruth or Derek Jeter or what have you, and so they've already got a person that they're interested in learning about. Okay, and a final comment here. I think we'll have this be the last one since we are running a lot over our time. I'm glad so many people have stuck around with us, though. Um, someone else saying that they did the similar thing here at their library, um, so just more like a uh, proof of concept. <laughs> On the topic of adults adjusting, you're talking about you know, them adjusting to whatever the changes you make. Several years ago, we separated our Christian fiction from our general fiction section and made it a section of its own. The circulation for those Christian fiction has increased exponentially, and our users know to just go to that section if they're only interested in Christian fiction. We did the same mm-hmm. with mysteries. It has worked really well with the adults. We have yet done our Dewey system change, but would love to do that as well. So um, there's just a, you know, the adults can adjust, you know, similar to the kids. They have the same, they do the same things like you're saying, I'm, I read mysteries, I read westerns, I read whatever, where are they? Yeah. Well, and, and the only complaint we had, we had one complaint, mm-hmm. and it was from a retired librarian who had moved to the area, mm-hmm. and she was very familiar with the Dewey system. So she was our only complaint, and I classify librarian users as staff because they have that understanding of, of how libraries work and I classify their feedback differently from our users because yeah. they are different groups of people. So we only did mm-hmm. have the one complaint and it was from a retired librarian and she wanted the Dewey but then again she knew exactly right. where to go where yeah. we, because we've been trained in this sort of classification system where our typical average user has not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, doesn't look like any last minute people, any desperate questions have come in, but if you do have questions, there's um, Jez's email address. You can definitely contact her there. She'll tell you everything you ever wanted to know about it <laughs> um, yep, and get you the, um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, <laughs> the uh, documents that you're, if you're looking for any of her resources. So thank you so much, Jasmine. That was awesome. Um, oh, you're very welcome. We did, thank you for having uh, me. Yeah, this is a great topic to have. As like, like I said, we've had some libraries here in Nebraska do it as well. I know... Um, one of our libraries did a presentation at a conference a few years ago, and we did have on here on the show someone talking about it as well. So there's lots of information out there. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm going to pull back presenter control now to bring back to my screen here. There we go. Switch. There we go. And this is one of the sessions I was talking about that we had here on Encompass Live on um, the teen um, section um, at uh, La Vista Public Library. They had they did it, and they did involve the teens full on with um, doing this, actually. So that was really in- nice what they did there. They um, were totally involved with redoing this, this section. The teens at this particular library and their teen advisory board are very, very involved in what the library does for them. So um, if you're interested, this is on our um, Encompass Live website in our archives um, section of our website. This is a list of all the all of our Encompass Live shows we've done. Um, you can see here, and this is where the recording of today's show will go as well. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, I hope you'll join us next time where it is our monthly Tech Talk with Michael Sowers, who was just on the line chatting with Jasmine. Um, he is our technology innovation librarian, and once a month he comes on and does more techie-related type show. Uh, next Wednesday he has um, Professor Liz Lawley on the show talking about the Just Press Play um, program that they have done at um, their university where she Rochester Institute of Technology, there it is, in New York, um, and talking about the programming and the software they use for that. They're going open source with that, so you'll be able to um, borrow their program that they've done there um, using games to help with learning with the new students that are coming in. So sign up for that. Um, and if you are a Facebook user, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so do please like us on there. You'll get notices of when we have uh, new sessions um, coming up, when recordings are available. I always give a reminder every week to join us, log in right now on the fly for today's show. Um, other than that, that will wrap it up for today. Thank you very much for attending, and we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.